Ayuk was very impressed with how Brock prepared. And he said that Brock had come up to him and apologize for missing a few, missing him on a few things. He said, I'm going to get better and I'm going to feed you. And Ayuk was like, ah, <laughs> that's all I want to hear. <laughs> so he made Ayuk very happy. Um, Fred Warner said, how can you not be good? He's playing against the number one defense all the time. Kittle's calling him BCB. I don't know if they're putting his face on T-shirts like they do for Mike White in New York, but it seems like it has kind of that similar. Everyone wants him to succeed. How much, how far they think he can carry them, whatever, whatever, whatever. They clearly all want him to succeed. And I think everyone understands it takes more than just, it's not on Brock Purdy's shoulders for this team to succeed and fail. Well, because it definitely was not on Jimmy's. Even though he was having like a career year. But he definitely but, can hold the back. Like the quarterback can keep you from succeeding, right? Well, like you said, he just can't turn the ball over. So to me, if you feed them without throwing the ball to the other team, and I think these next two weeks are going to be a huge test. You're playing a – I think they're pretty good. I don't know where statistically they rank. I haven't checked. But I think they're going to be a problem for the 49ers because they're not going to be able to run the ball against this front. And then Seattle – like their defense is clearly leaking some oil over the last several weeks. But I do feel like in that environment, it's going to be a tough place to operate for a guy making a second career start. That place is going to be so fucking loud. We've already talked about it the other day with Baker. Like that, that is going to be, that's going to be a fantastic television product. Yeah. It's going to, that Thursday night game is going to be as good as it gets. So, I mean, he's just kind of going to get a baptism by fire. It's kind of crazy how fast everything happened. Did you see the clip of, uh, I think it was Johnny Holland, the linebacker coach, who was sitting there with Greenlaw, and they and like Greenlaw looks up, he's like Brock's in, and he's like Brock's in, because you know the the Nobody defense knew. just comes to the sideline, yeah. and it's not like everyone's communicating. You know the the defense it's not like is, the whole game stopped and Jimmy got carted off the field either, right? Exactly, that didn't happen. The defense is not on the offense's headset, right? They're on separate channels, so it's not like they're communicating. Like, get Brock ready. You're just t talking to your guys when the offense is off the field. All the defensive coaches are at the sideline. Uh, I think it was a little bit of a shock to everyone. I I do wonder if this group of guys, <laughs> Debo, Ayuk, Kittle, Use Check, McCaffrey, clearly. Just a little used to playing with just random quarterbacks. I mean, they have not exactly been just playing with one guy for the last six years. Think how many different guys have thrown Ayuk the ball. Like, literally, Ayuk, his rookie season, Jimmy. Then second year, <clears throat> they draft Trey, but Jimmy still stays. And then all offseason, he becomes best friends with Trey Lance. <laughs> because he's right, right, so George kind of did, too. They thought the yeah. transition was happening. So... You could argue they're just a group of offensive skill guys who are probably more well balanced than some guys around the league that are just kind of used to just one guy feeding them the rock and they might not, the transition would not go as well. Just in terms of like, how is this going to go? Like they're just used to kind of shit hitting the fan. And you would argue their, their receiving numbers have never been like Devontae Adams, 140 catches. I mean, that's just, right. that's just not going to be the case for the foreseeable future. Yeah, so that's an interesting dynamic in that you don't just have like one guy who relies on the quarterback to f Justin Jefferson style to feed him the ball 130 times a game. So you're right, they're used to sharing. I think they're used to having it be kind of incumbent on them to make plays. Like you're just going to get me the ball and then I got to make, you're going to throw it seven yards and then I'm going to run it for six more yards, right? That's Ayuk's deal. That's definitely Debo's deal. Certainly it's Kittle's deal. It's definitely Juice's deal. It's definitely McCaffrey's deal, right? Like it's kind of Jennings. It's just, hey, man, at third and seven, I'm going to go seven yards plus a foot, and you're just going to have to put it wherever I'm huge. I'll catch it. It is just a, like you said, I think you nailed it. Like it's a group of offensive skill guys that know um, they understand the assignment. <laughs> and the assignment is you got to go make that quarterback better. And that's all they've done. They've done it. Like they're confident that they can do it because they've done it many times. Several times they've done it. Well, like if you just told Kelsey, like Mahomes is gone for the year in like September, he'd be like, "Yeah, I'm done too. <laughs> like, I don't want to play." <laughs> and I wouldn't even. He'd be like, "What? How? How am I supposed to function? Who's going to get me the ball?" It, it would rattle most high volume wide receivers losing their star quarterback. Yeah, and the Niners have just somehow avoided for a team that paid once upon a time a guy 120 million and another guy they traded three first round picks. They never had a star quarterback. <laughs> they just, they, they never have. Hell, they've never even had a top 10 quarterback.
and still they've won four playoff games in three years, and it looks – I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but they're in good position to be back in the playoffs and really win the division with no top-10 quarterback over that entire time. Yet they've compensated one and traded for one like they were going to get one, but it never happened. I don't think it works on most teams, but I, I think one thing is clear with this team. Having a big ego quarterback would be a problem. You know, cool. Kyler on this team, whatever the situation with Zach Wilson is, that would be a problem. Like, you understand why there was such a priority put on Trey Lance's personality, clearly. Because introducing a really rich kid to this team who hasn't proven anything and acts like he's earned it when he hasn't would be a problem. Because it's a team of guys that, I mean, Kittle earned it. Ayuk was a first rounder, but I mean, he's been through it. Debo earned it. Jennings is earning it. Uh, Trent Williams basically was out of football and was like, I'll come back, but only if it's exactly what I know I should get. Fred Warner earned it. Like all these guys, right? It's it, it's a weird spot. Every spot is a weird spot, but a big ego quarterback would be a tough fit on the 49ers. You could argue really does a big ego quarterback beside like Rogers is kind of a weirdo. When I want to say weirdo. I mean, he's just, he's just different than a lot of quarterbacks. I don't really think it flies anywhere, you know, because the highest paid two best quarterbacks in Allen and Mahomes actually kind of feel like low ego guys with their teammates and the way they just operate with the guys. Think about Zach Wilson. The guys flipped on Josh Wilson or Zach Wilson and hated him. We're all like rookies. None of them have proven anything. Sauce Gardner's like, this is awesome. Garrett Wilson, who's been in the league for like seven games, like, fuck yeah. Elijah Moore, year two, like, thank you, Jesus, is kissing the football. I, I think it's a pretty natural reaction in the sport of football that, like, unless you were an all-time great player like Rodgers, you can get away with it. Most quarterbacks, especially guys, like, under 30 and don't have, like, a decade play, like, you kind of got to fall in line and just be a good guy, like, be a good teammate. The guy, people, everyone shifted on Kyler Murray so fast. And he's clearly, like, very talented. And, hell, he led him to the playoffs. And people just don't like him. Yeah, I, I think that's an underrated part back to the Purdy thing. And if I was a GM, I would never, ever draft a quarterback with questionable character. I just, I just don't think it's worth it. To me, you could argue that's just a non-starter. Like, it's, you could argue it's the guy borderline has, it's an unfair judgment of the individual. Like, he has to be that good. Did you see the Heisman finalists? TCU guy, Caleb Stenson Bennett. Uh, who's the fourth? Yeah. It's all quarterbacks. Uh, Desmond Howard tweeted, this looks like the Davey O'Brien Award. Um, I'd imagine it's the same crew of guys for Davey O'Brien Award, right? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> maybe Penix will be in there for the Davey O'Brien just because he led the nation in passing. Um, but... I remember a buddy of mine telling me one time a few years ago, who, a guy who played in the league for several years, he was like, you know, quarterbacks can be a little awkward. He's like, a lot of quarterbacks are awkward. And the reason they're awkward is because that they always think everybody's looking at them. And the reason they always think everybody's looking at them is because a lot of the time everybody is looking at them. And so for some guys, they can follow them after their playing career. They just don't quite fit in all the time. You know, I think everyone always assumes the quarterback is the most like guy and the leader. But part of that is a projection that you put on a quarterback because that's the quarterback's role. And so every guy tries to kind of play that role, but every guy isn't that guy. And so when you have a quarterback that knows how to fit in, it's a I think it's a unique skill. We assume they all can, but it's they're like anybody else. It just just because you have the skill set, the physical skill set doesn't have mean you have the emotional skill set. And you know, I, I don't know that it means anybody plays any harder for Brock or anything like that, but I think it makes his job a little bit easier, right? It gives me, honestly, a little bit more faith in him that I do think it's authentic that they believe in him. To whatever degree, whatever his – like they believe that they can go to war with him, right? Agreed. Now, it doesn't mean he's not going to throw a back-breaking pick. It doesn't mean he can make the throws that Jimmy can it, I also think the other thing with him that's impressive, and it has to impress them, like being the last pick, being a rookie quarterback 
it's one thing to be a backup quarterback to have the game he had the other day. I think to be a rookie quarterback and have the game he had the other day is a little different. If he'd been in the league for three years and had that game, that'd be a little it'd be a little bit of a different story. But to be a rookie and be toe to toe, like it was him versus Nate Sudfeld and he won. You got to just be, I don't know, you've got to be, you got to be a hard worker. You got to be smart. I, I would think that to be a rookie quarterback and be able to step into that spot, I, you've probably shown some people some things. When I heard that after every practice, or maybe it was after every meeting, that Brock, Greasy, <clears throat> and either Slowick or Kubiak, one of the two, go over every play from practice that Jimmy ran of the game plan. Because obviously he's doing the yeah. scout team. So the only way he doesn't get the physical reps. So the only way he gets the reps of the game plan is mental reps. And they've been doing that all season. And I think the guys, one thing in an NFL locker room, like where you're drafted and making a team early on in your career, you do gain respect. Like if you make the team as an undrafted free agent, like I bet a lot of guys on the team respect the shit out of Jordan Mason, right? Like that's hard to do. Come in, make the team, undrafted free agent, have the coaches, and just be good. Now, once you establish yourself, like you're where you're drafted, like Fred Warner's just a star. Like we don't talk that often. Like he was a third rounder. No, he's just established four or five year pro, one of the best players in the league, right? But those first couple of years, like God, how's he do it? You know, this guy overcame a lot because he was not guaranteed when he showed up, right, in OTAs or rookie minicamp to make the team when you're the Mr. Irrelevant. Anytime you're drafted, like clearly there are people in the building that like you, but there are no guarantees. You then still have to perform. You still have to understand and take in the information. You have to do well in practice, in weird situations and limited reps. And then you got to do well in the games in these preseason games when you're playing with who knows who. Guy, he was taking the backup reps to Trey Lance by, I think it was the second preseason game, right? Remember when Brock Purdy came in before Sudfeld and it became a story? I think yeah. we did a podcast. We like, God, that was kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. So he proved a lot quick. And that I think that's all any general manager or coach wants out of their later round guys that they just like fucking pedal to the metal, yeah. you know, and just really impress you and, and, and do so much where I can't either get rid of you or or the conversation at first. It's like, yeah, this guy, they drafted him probably thinking good practice squad guy, good guy to have around, develop and get a quarterback to like, is this guy going to be our backup quarterback? Yes. It turned out. And then Jimmy just happened to like, they, to your point, they were going to start the year with him as their backup. 